Hi, everyone. Welcome to part one of our workshop series, Taming the Tantrum. This is part one of three sessions that we'll have. I'm Susan Stiles Sumstein with Take Group Parenting Connection. And we also have today Amy Quayle um, from Klamath County Take Root. She's going to be monitoring the chat box if you have any comments you want to make. And then um, we have Barb Tennyson today, who's going to be facilitating the workshop. So um, welcome, everyone. And Barb, I'll let you take it from there. OK, that sounds good. Hi, I'm Barb Tennyson, and I've been an early childhood educa educator of some sort or another since the mid 70s. And the last 20 some years of my career, I spent doing uh, special education with preschoolers which was wonderful. And it got me a lot of practice with temper tantrums. Whoa, that's a busy screen. And it, um, I realized over time that my staff and I had a lot of really good successes with kids who were chronic temper tantrumers, but that what we knew wasn't really readily available out there in a package to parents. And a original director of the Take Root program, the parenting program, asked me to do something like this. So I've been putting Taming the Tantrum together. And I put it together as a two hour workshop, but I ended up going back to Take Root and saying, can I expand on it? So now we have it in um, three parts. So today we'll do the introduction to uh, Taming the Tantrum, part one, which is called How to Avoid a Life of Walking on Eggshells. Okay, you want to go to the next screen. There's the tantrum. A lot of people look at that and say, oh my, that's exactly. So if you have questions and things that you really are interested in learning about specifically, um, use the chat and we will address your your concerns right then, or I will kind of refer you to when we get to it because I kind of build on skills, I hope, that's my intention anyway, over the three parts. And I don't wanna put the cart before the horse sometimes. So, um, but if the first thing I usually do it well, let me explain what I mean by walking on eggshells. You wanna to go to the next one, Susan? There you go. So we're talking about children who temper tantrum regularly often, who have an impact on the family so that everybody in the family who was in kind of the immediate vicinity of the tantrumer feel like they have to tread carefully, walk on eggshells in order to avoid triggering a temper tantrum. And no matter how careful you are, you're still going to trigger temper tantrums because um, they just feel, they just, it's not like they plan on having a tantrum, it just happens. And they don't really have the skills and aware self-awareness to regulate their tantruming. So we're gonna try and get some information out to everybody about how to, um, teach these skills. Okay, so the eggshells are the, the next one, Susan. The eggshells are the five W's. Oh, okay. Oh, we're going down. Okay. The, the egg, first, the basic questions then. The quantity of tantrums. This is one of the things I usually ask the participants, and my participants tend to be uh, early childhood educators, daycare providers, home daycare providers, preschool teachers, parents, parents of children who um, maybe aren't theirs, like grandparents, foster parents often come, people who are trying to learn skills because they're going to be, their children have been removed from the home for some reason and they're trying to prepare for re getting the children back on a full-time basis. So I asked the participants, 
about the quantity of the tantrums. You know, first, do, do you have a tantrum in your family? What's the quantity? How many of you have a child in your care who tantrums every week? And usually I get a hand up. How many of you have a tantrum or who tantrums daily? And they kind of look around the room like, is it safe to admit that? Because of course, we all think it reflects on our poor skills if our children tantrum. But it's like, no, it's okay. How many of you have a child who tantrums every day? Then how many of you have a child who tantrums every hour? And now the floodgates usually open and both hands go up and they're waving their hands. And it's like, they can, it makes it safe. We could admit it. These kids are above and beyond the normal tantruming that children, preschool toddlers do. What is the quality of the tantrums when they, these children have their tantrums? What's the intensity level? Um, do they go from kind of getting crabby and cranky and building up to a tantrum? Or do they hit the ground running and they go from zero to 60 in, a, in two seconds and they're having a full blown meltdown? Um, do they cry so loud that you're afraid they're gonna hurt their vocal cords or that they make themselves throw up? What is the length? Do they have a temper tantrum and then within five minutes they're calming down and then you can talk about it? Or does it last for 45 minutes? Or does it last for an hour? That sort of thing. How quickly and easily are tantrums triggered? Um, even when you don't, you know, we know that if kids are tired and if kids are hungry, they're gonna tantrum fairly easily when they're young. But these are tantrums that happen regardless of taking care of the food and the napping and the resting. And then look at yourself. What are the effects on you? Have you thought about and really looked at how much of your life is spent walking on eggshells? Have you really put that into perspective? Or Because usually what happens is these children come into our lives and gradually we start noticing their tantruming and we reason with them, but the behaviors don't get better despite techniques that have worked successfully in the past with other, other children. And we get into habits of constantly trying to appease the child. Oh, well, we can't go to the store because so-and-so hasn't had their nap and they'll have this meltdown in the middle of the store. So why don't you run to the store and get milk and I'll stay with so-and-so. I mean, you just end up planning your whole life around the possibility of the child having a tantrum. And you make your decisions of your classroom or your household based on how likely it is this, this child will have a temper tantrum. When you are with other family members outside of your immediate family or friends or going into public, what are the effects on you having a, a tantrum, temper tantrumer? Do you feel like a failure? Do you feel like everybody's watching you? Are you afraid to discipline or set limits or be consistent because you might have to deal with a tantrum and then everybody's gonna be staring at you and you know from past experience that it's not going to go well, that these tantrumers, once they start, keep going and nothing you do is going to have any effect. And usually when I'm doing this workshop, the people are looking at each other, especially if a couple comes together, like, okay, good, they get me. This is, the, we're talking about my real world because it becomes something that gradually gets hidden from the rest of the world a lot of times because the feedback from the rest of the world has been, well, if they, you know, if, if so-and-so would just spank the child or if so-and-so hadn't spoiled the child, then they wouldn't be having this problem now. And it's, that's not the issue, but they don't see what's going on in your day-to-day -day interactions, that there's a lot of judgment regardless of what they know and what they don't know. Um, so let's go on to the eggshells. What are the eggshells? So we talk about the five W's. So the who, what, when, where, and why. Who's having the tantrum? What are the triggers for the tantrum or the trigger? When are they most likely to happen? Where are they most likely to happen? Do you know the whys of what causes them? Um, 
those are all kind of inter, very interrelated, not kind of, they're very interrelated. But really, it's very useful to think, use the five W's to just, when the child is tantruming, instead of trying to appease the child during the tantrum, kind of start looking at these. Well, what caused the tantrum? Is this where it is all the time? I haven't really thought about it, but every day at 1130, I end up dealing with the tantrum. I hadn't really noticed that those kinds of things and start kind of paying attention to it from the perspective of the eggshells, the five W's. And the other thing to really look at is, is it during a transition? Um, I harp on transitions or I mention transitions a lot because most children who are frequent intense tantrumers are not able to handle transitions. For whatever reason, as soon as they sense that a change is going to happen in what's going on right now, they, they're going to react against the change. And there are, there are ways to deal with that, but it's something that's important to know. If the child you're dealing with tantrums primarily most intensely during a transition, then we're going to, down the road as we get some skills in place, really look at how to plan transitions so that they do not trigger temper tantrums and that so that they build on making the child successful and able to change from one activity to the next in a cheerful, positive, normal way. How do caregivers respond to the tantruming behavior? Um, some people respond to tantruming by reasoning with the tantrumer. Okay, look, look, stop, just stop crying right now. As soon as you get done, we'll, and, and they're really trying to explain something and explain that, hey, if you stop now, it's gonna be good. Here, we get to do this, or they bribe. If you stop tantruming, I'll give you a sucker. If you want a piece of candy, then you have to stop tantruming. Or they become controlling. Shut up or I'll give you something to cry about. And just instantly react against the tantrum in very angrily. Those are all common responses. And so we're gonna look at some of those responses what works among the responses and what doesn't work among the responses. One of the things to know is that tantrums are a neurological issue. That means they're from the brain and the nervous system. So what we're gonna do now is show a short um, video. It's only two minutes about, temper about stress and children and how it affects learning. This is the third temper tantrum. I mean, the third video in a series, they're each just two minutes long about brain development and the ability to learn. So let's go ahead. This is the third one that covers stress just because for the sake of time, we aren't gonna show all three. Learning to deal with stress is an important part of healthy development. When experiencing stress, the stress response system is activated. The body and brain go on alert. There's an adrenaline rush, increased heart rate, and an increase in stress hormone levels. When the stress is relieved after a short time, or a young child receives support from caring adults, the stress response winds down and the body quickly returns to normal. In severe situations, such as ongoing abuse and neglect, where there is no caring adult to act as a buffer against the stress, the stress response stays activated. Even when there is no apparent physical harm, the extended absence of response from adults can activate the stress response system. Constant activation of the stress response overloads developing systems with serious lifelong consequences for the child. This is known as toxic stress. Over time, this results in a stress response system set permanently on high alert. 
In the areas of the brain dedicated to learning and reasoning, the neural connections that comprise brain architecture are weaker and fewer in number. Science shows that the prolonged activation of stress hormones in early childhood can actually reduce neural connections in these important areas of the brain at just the time when they should be growing new ones. Toxic stress can be avoided if we ensure that the environments in which children grow and develop are nurturing, stable, and engaging. So there's so much going on in that short two minute video. I just love it. I could go on and on and on about it. But I, the part that I want to really hit strongly about is the neural connections that they're talking about that should be growing instead of disappearing in the brain from lack of use. A child who is a frequent ongoing tantrumer is kind of one of these children who is always on high alert. They're always afraid that there's going to be a change. They're always afraid that something's going to happen that's going to make them upset or that's going to somehow trigger and set off this whole tantrum, temper tantrum. So they are at risk of becoming, um, having difficulty learning as they get older. Not to mention the fact that if they're prone to temper tantrums, then they're going to spend a lot of their time not being in a position where they're learning anything anyway. So we really, really want to teach children how to handle their stress levels from a very young age and how to respond to changes in their life and how to respond to situations in more appropriate ways so that they are able to develop the kind of neurological um, brain and central nervous system systems that will allow them to be calm and reasonable. The other thing about this video is in the beginning when it shows stress and it says adrenaline rush, rushes through the body and stress hormones are activated and go all through the body. When the adrenaline and the stress hormones are flowing through the bloodstream and they're rushing from the body up to the brain again and bathing the brain basically is what happens in these, in these um, hormones, the child is frankly in fact, not just a child, anybody in that position from birth to death is not able to reason. When you are stressed like that, the brain basically has shut down. It's fight or flight. That's the only response that you have. It is only after the tantrum and the, the adrenaline and the hormones have settled down that the brain will be able to engage and even notice that you're talking to them and really be able to focus. So when I talk about earlier, how do caregivers respond to temper tantrums? When people get down in a child's face and try to engage the child and reason with them while they're tantruming, they're reasoning with a block of wood. There's nothing there to engage with. Their, their brain is, is shut down, they're too, they're too stressed. So that is a technique that is basically best left alone. Getting down in their face and reasoning with them and having a conversation about what upset them is great, but it has to happen after the tantrum is over. It has to happen during down times, neutral times, not while the brain is in such a set, a fight or flight kind of a, a of setup. Um, Otherwise, you're just simply not going to be successful. The other thing is it tends to make the tantrums last a lot longer because they've got you on some primitive level. They're aware of your presence and they keep you there, even though they're not reciprocating and interacting with you, but they are getting your attention. So they'll take it. And all temper tantrums are basically ultimately a bid for attention of some sort. Good attention, bad attention. It's just the bid for attention. So then look at the child. Um, if you want to get them to get rid of all that hormone stress, fight or flight hormones flowing through their bloodstream, you want to make them slow to tantrum and quick to recover. 
instead of being quick to tantrum and slow to recover. Because, and that's the normal response. We get mad. Oh God. Okay. We get over it. And then we move on. That's where we're going. That's what we're going to try and look for. How can we do that with these children? The other thing is they talk about the neurons that kind of disappear. In children, neurons are developing all the time. If you are interacting most with children who are temper tantruming, the neurons that temper tantrum are the ones that are going to keep developing. So you don't want to keep reinforcing the development of the very neurons that you don't want. The neurons for carrying on a two-way conversation, for being able to understand their behaviors, those kinds of neurons, they simply are not given a chance to develop. So it's a brain thing. It's always important to look at this kind of as an objective outsider is how can I develop the neurons in the brain in this situation? It's baby steps. You don't do a big development, but you give the brain practice in developing the neurons slowly over time. Okay, let's move on. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to ask um, what to do, figuring out the causes. So look at transitions as a, is that a cause? Is that something that typically are you finding is, is typically in place during one of your child's reactions? And then um, are you acting on the problem or are you reacting to the problem? When you react to the problem, that's kind of like the example of getting down on their face and trying to reason with them or telling them to shut up or I'll give you something to cry about. Those are reactions. They're not any kind of a problem solving. It's just like, let's just get this over with as quickly as we can. But there's no learning on how to not do it the next time, how, not, how to handle the, the, these intense feelings and keep control over them instead of just letting go and just having a full-blown tantrum. So we can teach the children how to respond appropriately just like we can teach children how to identify colors and just how the way we can teach children how to learn their ABCs or their triangles, shapes, or how to ride a tricycle, those sorts of things. So it's something we have to plan for and act on instead of react to. So just in general over, just kind of looking at it over um, the broad term, we're going to brainstorm. What kinds of things could be triggering the temper tantrums? What do you think it is? And what, understand what is a transition? So if children are watching TV and you tell them, okay, it's time to turn the TV off and go get your pajamas on and go to bed, that's a transition. If they're in a preschool classroom, okay, it's time to put the toys away and come sit at circle or go wash your hands for snack or whatever or they're playing outside, okay, let's go. We gotta go get go back into the house or back and get, get in the car. Those are all transitions. We're changing what we're doing and we're going to go do something else. Even if it's a fun transition, okay, let's go get in the car and go get ice cream. If they have the brain neurons strongly developed to fight transition, they'll fight that too, even if it's fun because it's a transition. So you want to look at, it, are they having trouble with the transitions, understanding what a transition is, and then look at the transitions and see what kinds of things seem to be working or not working during the transition. And again, brainstorm. I read an article one time that really helped me called arsenic, about arsenic hours within the family. And it can be in any type of setting, daycare providers, preschool classrooms, home life, whatever. For me, a big arsenic hour was getting up in the morning and getting ready to go. And I have, have one of my children was a bright and early, first light was up and, but always up and ready to go and stuff, but never ready to go to school when it was time to leave. No, he'd go watch TV and then he'd say, okay, turn it off. Or, okay, I'll turn it off as soon as this is over. And there's always something to catch their attention. And the next thing happened and the next thing happened. And then all of a sudden we're in crisis mode. We're going to be late. 
So we dealt with that arsenic hour by saying, if you are up and you have um, eaten breakfast, got your clothes on, wash your face, brush your teeth. If you have your shoes on and your backpack is by the door ready to go and there's still time, then you can watch TV. That's family rule. It wasn't me. Okay, that's what's gonna happen from now on. We just said, these are the, this is the family rule. And it was just absolutely amazing how quickly that became the rule. And we had another child and it, he, it was just the norm. He didn't know any different. So that was how we dealt with mornings. Um, some people, it's bedtime, same sort of thing, just set the family rule is if you've done this, this, and this, then you can have this, you know, those kinds of things. So what are you, know what your arsenic hours are. Don't just get sucked into them and think, oh, today is going to be fine. I can't wait to get up and get going. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, it's chaos again. Stand back and look at it. Is this an arsenic hour? What keeps happening? What are the impediments that make it be an unsuccessful time for us? Bedtime, right before dinner, getting home from daycare, those kinds of things are really typical arsenic hours. Okay, let's try the next one, Susan. Okay, so figuring out a plan. This We'll get into this more in the other workshops. But the first thing I tell parents to do is to prioritize what are the tantrums that drive you the most nut? What are the behaviors that are the most irritating to you? So maybe you make a list of 10. Every time we're gonna to go to the grandparents' house, we have this big fight or, um, Every time I tell them to go put their shoes on, we have to have this big fight, whatever it is, just write them all down and then pick out one or two that are the most problematic out of all the problematic ones, which are the ones that bug you the most. And we'll just work on those two. The others, once you get a pattern established, the others kind of fall into place. So you don't need to try to fix every single one on your list, but you do need to look at Say, oh yeah, you know, that is. And if you're teaching with another teacher, if you're parenting with another person, whatever, what bothers you the most may not bother them and vice versa. So it really helps to tag team this so that you're both on the same page at the same time. I may not know that it bothers this person, the other person so badly, because it's just, you know, for me, kids are gonna climb up slides. For my staff in the preschool, that was just such a huge no-no. And I had to follow through and not let the kids climb up the slide for the sake of consistency in the classroom, even though it was, I think it's something that kids won't do it until they feel like they're ready. I didn't see it as a really much of a safety risk because we were always out there supervising, but we just made it the rule at school rules, you go up the steps and down the slides and everybody followed that. We were just consistent. So you've got to look at what bothers you the most, what bothers your co-worker the most, your co-caregiver the most, and prioritize and pick two that you're going to, as a team, work on together. And focus on those, watch them for a while, and then brainstorm. What do you think causes them? What do you think are some of the issues that are surrounding it? Um, Try some, brainstorm some ideas. Maybe if we tried this, you're going to evaluate later. How did that work when we tried that? And then if it's not working great or it's kind of in the ballpark, but not quite there, maybe generate some new ideas. The big thing is using the KISS approach. And the KISS stands for keep it short and sweet. So I've known people who have planned out huge sticker charts. And at the end of two weeks, you get to earn money and stickers and you get to go to the store and you get to buy this, that's too complex. You need to have some kind of a positive reinforcement, do something, notice it, give a positive reinforcement and move on. You don't stretch it out over two weeks and sticker charts because frankly, children under the age of eight or nine I have a really not good sense of how time passes. So that my youngest used to say he 
get up from a nap and say, is today tomorrow? Like we talked about, we're going to do that tomorrow. They don't really understand. It all just kind of flows together. Whatever's in my face right now, that's all that exists right now. So you want to use the KISS approach and give, just like puppy training, you want to give them the reinforcement right away so that it starts building a skill quickly and right into their, right there in their focus. Okay, let's try the next slide. Now this, this is, let me see. Okay, I'm doing good for time. This is kind of a tricky one reinforcement. A lot of times, and I would get new staff members over the years, and it would take a while to teach them that they are catching the children doing the wrong thing and giving them lots of attention for it instead of redirecting them and noticing when they're doing the right thing and giving them lots of attention for it. You can catch a lot more flies with honey, especially when you are trying to teach children social skills and behavioral skills. So we have to think about if a child is having a temper tantrum and we are giving them attention for it and talking to them and reasoning with them, we are reinforcing the very behavior that we don't want to see. And it seems like we're doing the right thing. We're being an adult and we're giving them all the reasons. But what happens is we're kind of like the adults in all the Charlie Brown cartoons. All they hear is wah, 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 wah. and they don't really get what you're saying. They just get your undivided attention. So it's really good to know when to ignore behaviors. And then the third one down is when to catch the child being good, when to notice and point out that you've noticed, let them know you've noticed that they're doing the right thing. When to interact with the child, when not to interact with the child. And I will the most extreme example I can think of that really kind of makes the point, I think, it, in a more obvious way. I wish I, years ago we'd had video cameras and I could have videotaped this child and shown you. But I had a, a little girl, drop dead gorgeous, sweet little thing, and temper tantrum at the drop of a hat, lasted for a good 45 minutes every single time. And she would actually vomit. She would literally grab the doorknob, try to get out of the room and climb the wall. And all the other kids were trying to proceed with the class. And I would have to sit there with my foot blocking the door so she couldn't get out and ignoring her while she's screaming in my ear and talking to the other kids and giving them lots of attention and normal interactions while ignoring her behavior. However, as soon as she would stop crying to catch her breath or to check us out and see if we're watching, I would say, oh, good, you're being quiet. Do you want to? And that as soon as she got my attention, she was trained to tantrum. So she would start screaming again. And it took about two weeks of ignoring the tantruming behavior and letting her tantrum herself out, but giving her attention whenever she quieted down and what happens also is during that two weeks is the behaviors got worse because the only strategy she had up to this point in her life was to scream and tantrum and it got her everything she needed. She always got her way. So the thought, you know, it was automatic on her part that if I'm not getting my way, I must not be screaming and tantruming enough. I'm going to do it even better so that they'll start giving me what I want. But when, but we kept making sure that we found little instances to notice her when she was not screaming in tantrum and giving her a lot of positive attention. There were other things going on too, but this was a big part of it. And at the end of the two weeks, the behaviors just started, they didn't just kind of gradually drop off, they went boom. 
and she really started to um, turn into a really wonderful, positive human being. She was, during this time, referred to an autism specialist to see if that's what was going on. And we had her checked for hearing to see if she was hard of hearing and if that was part of the problem. And the autism specialist was baffled. And at the end, a little after the two weeks had ended, she came into the room with her supervisor to try and see if she could get some help. And our problem child looked up at her, smiled brightly and said, hi. And that was the end of the autism evaluation. So I've seen examples on all different levels of that same sort of situation happen with children when we ignore the negative and reinforce the behaviors that we want to see, reinforce the positive behaviors. And even when we are having to give instructions, even when we're having to tell them this is not going to be okay, we don't do it like, oh, you little brat type of a voice. That's not okay. Stop it. You're just bugging me because you know you can. It's, we're respectful. No, that is not okay. When you use a quiet voice, then we will talk about it. When you use a quiet voice, then we'll talk about it. And we, we are firm and respectful and never derogatory to, towards the child. This establishes their ability to trust us with their emotional well-being. So, and that's true of anybody of any age. So these are, this is a lot to take in, the reinforcement. But as I learned this skill and started to incorporate it, it got easier and easier. Um, I have even found myself putting myself in a bubble with a temper tantrum going on and turning my back, but trying to keep hyper vigilant about what the child's doing so they don't run away, run out the door, or something like that, and staying very close, but not giving them any eye contact or any social interaction until they're quiet, even for two seconds, they get, a, get my attention and then I'll turn away. It's just puppy training. Again, it's just trying to, you're, instead of giving them little puppy treats, you're giving them little eye contacts and little individual personal attention, and it works. Okay, Susan, let's try the next one. Okay, teaching social and anger management. So children are not born knowing all of this. This is something that is taught. They need to be taught. This particular website is one that even after I had been teaching for, at this point, almost 30 years, I got training and they use this website. <sighs> Let me see something here. So I've got a couple of minutes. I can explain a little bit about this. After the Columbine shooting and the school shootings, researchers and psychologists and people really started studying what was going on with these children that they were so disenfranchised that they would that they would do commit such horrible acts against their fellow students and their teachers and they really started to over the years find consistent patterns consistent um, social interactions social situations that kind of would lead to more of this antisocial behavior. And they implemented a program called Positive Behavior and Intervention Support in the high schools where, of course, the crimes had been primarily committed. And it was successful using their research and their study and training teachers and administration and taking a different attack from, instead of punishing every child who committed every single infraction, really looking at what was going on in that child's personal life and trying to build on the child's successes and bring them out of the red zone of behavior problems and down lower into the, the broader social um, structure where more normal interactions could take place. It was so successful that um, middle school started saying, we've got these students, we can identify them at the middle school age, we need this kind of thing too. And it was implemented in the middle school and then the elementary school, and then finally at the preschool and even infant toddler stage. And this is where they, we were part of a, a pilot program learning how to implement the 
the preschool behavior supports. And so this is the Center for Social and Emotional Foundation for Early Learning. And I love this model. I learned things that I thought I already knew. And it was like, where have you been all my life? This was so wonderful. So if you go to this site, the CEPHAL Center for Social and Emotional Foundations for Early Learning is abbreviated to CEPHAL. It's housed at Vanderbilt University. Um, Susan, you want to go down to the Apple? I'm trying to move my screen and it's not happening. And you go into the Apple and you click on it. So here's the thing, like I said before, children are not known, are not born knowing how to interact in socially appropriate ways necessarily. Some kids are better at it than others, just like some kids are born better athletes or born better musicians or they have some talents earlier in life than others, but everybody can learn these skills and how to be more appropriate. And so this site provides a lot of resources on how to teach these kinds of strategies for caregivers to basically birth to seven or eight year olds. So if you go down the um, the scripted social stories gives you picture books that you can print out. So um, on the first column, the bottom one, I can use my words. You can print out a story and read it to your child about how to use words instead of erupting into anger, that sort of thing. Um, Tucker the Turtle is a whole nother workshop, but it's a storybook. And there's there's if you go to Pinterest or Google and Google Tucker the Turtle, you'll see all kinds of activities people have done because Tucker the Turtle, here we go, there he is. He learns how to, when he starts to feel angry, he goes inside his shell and counts and takes three deep breaths and tries to think of another way to handle the problem. And then he comes back out. And we, you can use this and have all the children pretend like they're going into a shell, taking deep breaths, coming out and, and solving a problem. It's a story, it's a fun puppet, it's a fun activity. So I think it's a great, um, there's great stories in there for doing it. The next one, oh, see, I keep trying to touch it, Susan. Go down to, can you go back to that page real quick to the website? I'm sorry, to the Apple and then the book nook, yeah. So there's um, the book nook, these books, teach social skills and each one of these in the book nook there's activities for games for snack ideas for um, songs for all kinds of activities to do to reinforce the social skill that this book is addressing and if you go down one more susan one more i'm sorry where's the book list oh i went too far go up go this is yeah that's there's another above this i know where it is it's right above this is the book the book list there's six pages they're divided into categories of teaching book feelings about happy a category of teaching feelings about how to be sad or being angry that are all and they give you the age range of the child that it's appropriate for and they're just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful books um, that you can find at used bookstores. It's where I get a lot of mine. You can get them at the libraries. You can um, order them off of book, you know, book sites like Amazon and, and Borders. And I'm a big supporter of Powell's if you can, can do that because they're struggling. So I just think that you can do a lot during the downtimes when a child's not upset reading a storybook and it's a great discussion starter about things that you can do to teach kids how to handle emotions.
And I don't know when we're going to do it, Susan, but I know some periodically during the year I teach a book called Happy Monster, Sad Monster about using books, specifically addressing this. That that's kind of fun. Yeah, that okay. might be something we could do next quarter. Okay, great. That'd be fun. Okay, Susan, now we can go on to the next one. Okay. So, so there's Tucker the turtle. I want to show one other one that's not in the slide that somebody said, oh, you've got to get this for your workshops. These are called feisty friends, feisty pets. And here's, and they come in all different sweet animals. And then you squeeze right behind the ears. <laughs> and the adults always go, ah, the kids love it because it's a really dramatic representation of, of emotion. So look, the teddy bear is so happy now. He's not happy, he's mad. It's a way to playfully talk about emotions. And they just think he's so sweet and cuddly. Um, Hands are not for hitting in these whole series. Those are wonderful books for teaching skills on how to be social. This one, I found it Marshall's or Ross or something like that. And it's just a memory game, but it has to do with facial expressions for feelings, which is another great approach. There's lots of, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're sad and you know it, cry boo-hoo. There's a lot of things out there for teaching emotions that are really useful and helpful and fun for the kids and they enjoy it. They don't feel like they're being taught. They aren't as resistant when you make it playful. Okay, let's see what else. I think we're just about done, yeah. Okay, so I do wanna talk about this area quickly-ish, just because I want people to understand that sometimes tantrumers are children who have um, not, sometimes they, are, they don't hear very well Sometimes they can hear, but they cannot process what they hear. Wah, 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 wah. They can hear you talking, but they don't know what you're saying. The words don't have meaning. It's called auditory processing. There are two types of skills that are assessed with, um, for communication. The expressive language skills. Can the child say what they mean? at an age appropriate level? Do they have an age appropriate vocabulary? Um, a lot of children who cannot express themselves well around age four, especially, if they don't have the vocabulary or the ability to form words, they get very frustrated and the tantruming behavior, the frustration behavior, it tends to increase. So, and then the receptive skills are the children who talk, when they do get the words, they understand what they mean, but they don't process what's said to them very well, or they don't hear, they're damaged to their ear for some reason and they aren't hearing. Those are the receptive skills. So you really want to ch get a child who is a frequent tantrumer and not a good communicator, get them evaluated. And if you find that they have a high normal expressive score, but a very low receptive score or vice versa, those kids who have a big gap in skill level between expressive and receptive skills, they, it's amazing, but they really tend to be a lot more tantrumer. They often tend to be considered autistic or on the spectrum somehow where if you can get the communication disorder addressed and drastically improved, you'll find that these autistic -y type behaviors kind of really fade away. The child may still always be kind of a little bit odd, but it's, it, they're so busy defending themselves, trying to prevent the world from understanding how little they're under, they are understanding you that they tend to come up with a lot of behaviors. And if they're put on the spot, they'll throw a full-blown tantrum in order to get out of having to do the task at hand and show you that they can't do it. They don't wanna be a failure. So I think that's a, it's not all children who have temper tantrums by any means, 
but there was, you know, in my experience, I came across a definite cluster of children who fit this description every single year and who were, um, it was almost like the Heller, Helen Keller when she understood what the signing was, that it's almost magical when they begin to understand and make up for the gaps that they've had up to that point. So at that case, you would wanna call your local early intervention program and get an evaluation and it's free and it can maybe give you some useful information on how to, how to teach your child some skills and how to address the why, the why of what the, is causing the temper tantrums. Okay, anything else, Susan? Okay, so there's some strategies. The Cephal site we went over and the book nook, it was in that, um, in that Apple page. There's another one on the Cephal website. If you can go to the family routine guide, it's 40 some pages of giving you common causes of temper tantruming behavior. That's what it looks like. And how, ideas for brainstorming, what might be the causes, ideas for brainstorming possible interventions and solutions and um, ideas for reevaluating and coming up with a new one, a new approach. So it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful resource. And it's got really down to earth, like practical time to take a bath or hygiene or um, take, you know, temper tantrums if they have to eat food or whatever like that, you know, mealtime temper tantrums or behaviors and transitionings and bedtime temper tantrums, all kinds of things. And they, it's got really real world problems that people come across all the time. And I think very practical solutions and ideas that are, you don't have to use them, but they really get the juices flowing, give you ideas and ways to think about how to handle your own situation. And if you go to the bottom of the Douglas ESD for you.org, that's the organization that we're kind of involved in here. There you go. Just resources for parents and families, all kinds of resources, just kind of a clearinghouse of really good information on where to turn and where to go. Next Wednesday, same bat time, November 10th at two o'clock. And if you have any questions, let me know. Thanks, Barb, that was great. Um, did we have Amy, any comments or questions in the chat? If not, I guess we'll sign up for today and we will see you here again um, next Tuesday, the 10th at two o'clock. Thanks everybody. Wednesday, isn't it? Uh, I think it's Tuesday the 10th. Okay, you you know more than I do. I'll, it's in my calendar. Okay, because we have Veterans Day on Wednesday. That's what it is. Yes, of course. Yeah. All exactly. right. Okay, thank Everybody, you. Thank you. Bye-bye.